We were at a place called For the Win with my boys, my wife and I, and her parents, as well as her brother and sister-in-law. And it's like a Dave and Buster's. If you've ever been to Dave and Buster's, an adult Chuck E. Cheese, the kids were there, and, and there's all kinds of games that you can play, and they have, they have the prize area. So you collect tickets as you play all of your games, and they have the prize area at the end. Uh, you can take all your tickets, and you can get something. Well, there was a special that day where you got a certain amount of, of tickets for eating there, so we ate there, and then we played some games, and then we compiled all of our tickets, and our boys went to the prize area, and they looked at the prize area, and they saw a miniature air hockey table, and that's all that they wanted. They saw everything else, and they saw this miniature air hockey table, and the boys could actually agree that that is what they wanted. That in and of itself is miraculous. That in and of itself is a sign from God, maybe they're supposed to have the air hockey table. Until we saw how many tokens the air hockey table was. We had about 23,000 tickets. The air hockey table was 40,000 tickets. And I just explained to them, I'm like, sorry guys, we're not getting the air hockey table. And they're like, but dad, we really want it. And I said, you're going to want a lot of things in life but you're not going to get them all. And so today is just going to be one of those times. We're not buying any more tokens to play any more games to get any more tickets. We're done. But we really want it, Dad. We really want it. Now, I was ready to leave. We, we, we could find something else. But their grandfather and their uncle were with us. And they overhear this. And the next thing you know, they're over at the money machine buying more tokens so that we can play more games. Lucky us. And so we went through and we played some more games and they won the 17,000 more tickets that they needed. They went to the prize table and they got the miniature air hockey table, which to this day is at our house. To this day, this... Miniature air hockey tables at our house. It comes in a box. You put it together. It's just, it's pretty simple to put together. You just screw in a couple pieces and you snap on the rest. Not exactly quality craftsmanship. Undoubtedly not worth 40,000 tickets, but we get it. And then we decide to turn it over and see, oh, there's no plug for it. You have to go buy batteries. So I have to leave and go to the store and buy batteries. I get back. We plug in the batteries, and they are so excited because they'd seen this air hockey table earlier in the day. They'd gotten their extra tickets because they scammed their grandfather and their uncle. And we got it, and we got it back to the house. We set it up. We put the batteries in. We turned it on. And nothing happened. Nothing. And they start crying, like just so upset that nothing, nothing was able to happen. And so I went back to For the Win with a broken air hockey table. I went back to the prize table and said, hey, we won this earlier today and it's not working. Can we get another one? And they were great about it. They swapped it out. I bring it back, we set it up, we put in new batteries, we turn it on, and nothing works. Nothing works. So at this point in time, one of my family members, who shall remain nameless, says, are you sure you got the right batteries, Brian? Yes, I can read, thank you. Maybe just go try another kind of battery. Okay, great. Why don't I do that? Why don't I go back to the store and buy a battery that the directions say it doesn't take and see if those batteries will fit in the bottom of the game and see if that will power on the game. And I said, yeah, why don't you do that? I'm like, there's just some battles. You just don't fight. And so we went back to the store and we tried even different batteries. But we had the same result. We had the same result. Nothing would power this up. And what my boys learned in that process is that there is a key component sometimes to games. 
There's a key component sometimes to games. It doesn't matter how excited you are to play the game. It doesn't matter how much fun it looks like. There is a key component, in this case, batteries. And if you can't get any power, you can't get the air to function in this game. And when there's no power, the game is worthless. And it's meaningless. There's a key component in our lives. That if we do not possess this, as followers of Jesus, we're basically told our lives are lived without meaning. And that's what we're going to look at today as we look at 1 Corinthians 13. So if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not streaming on them, feel free to follow along on our event on the Bible app. It's a great resource. We recommend that you download it and utilize it in your day-to-day life. It's a great resource. It's available totally free in the app store. Just type in Bible and you can find it there. Within that app, there's a feature called events and you can follow along with us as we dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this morning, starting verse 1, where we read these words. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I'm the most well-spoken, articulate person, if I'm the most well-spoken, articulate person that people just flock to come and to listen to, that people love to hear me speak, and many of politicians have gotten where they are in their career because they possess this ability. Many celebrities have gotten to where they are in their career because they are able to do this. He says, if I can speak with the best of them, if I can communicate in the language of heaven, if I can communicate in a supernatural way, in a language of heaven. But if I don't have love, if I don't have love, then everything I say is ear-piercing. It's ear-piercing. It doesn't matter that I'm the most articulate person in the world. It doesn't matter that I can, that I can communicate in heaven's language. If love does not radiate in my life, then I'm ear-piercing. And he continues, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. He says, if I have visions, if I have visions from God himself, if God himself supernaturally gives me visions, if I understand every prophecy, if I understand every mystery, if I understand every conspiracy this world has ever known, if I can understand things of God and things of this world that nobody else can understand, and if I watch God do incredible things, not only around me, but also through me. If I watch God work and move around me and through me, but I do not possess love, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. It doesn't matter what abilities I have. It doesn't matter the cool things that I've seen God do. I am nothing if I am not driven by love. And then just to hammer the point home, because he wants you to really understand how vital this is, he says this, if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I gain nothing. If I give away everything, if I am the most generous person this world has ever seen, I give it all away. I just give it all away. People celebrate when they hear about it. There are wings of hospitals that are named after my generosity. There are foundations that are founded. There are scholarships. You name it. If I give away everything that I have earned, I give that all away. If I die the worst possible death for you, if I am willing to lay down my life and to die the worst possible death that I could possibly think of for you, but I do so without love, but if love is not the hallmark of my life, if love does not define me in who I am, I've done it all in vain. I've done it all in vain. All that generosity all that sacrifice, all the gifting that God has given me, all the knowledge that I've obtained, 
all the words that I have spoken, if love is not what drives me at my core, it's worthless. I am nothing, and I have entirely missed the point. As people who follow Jesus, love is not optional. We don't get the choice. We don't get to choose whether or not we want to love each other. We don't get to choose. This is the point. That as people who follow Jesus, we are compelled to love. And the scary thing is that we can, we can do incredible things. We can do incredible things for God. We can be great people. We can be generous people. We can be really knowledgeable people. We can be articulate people. We can be all of these things, he says. And we can do it all without being driven by love. And if that's true of us, then what we do is empty. And it doesn't ultimately matter. Now, we're about to get to some of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. Undoubtedly, if you've been to a wedding, you, you've heard them numerous times. You've heard them read. You've heard them discussed. It's like getting on the airline, and they give you the safety briefing that you've already got the noise-canceling headphones on for because you've heard it a million times. It, it doesn't even factor in with you anymore. And this, this could be true of what we're about to read. So I, I just want to caution you, don't miss this. Don't gloss over it because you've heard it so many times. Understand that there is something that needs to be conveyed to us about the verses that we're about to read, which define for us what love is and what love is not. And that these are really important. So even though you've heard them hundreds or thousands of times in your life, just, just don't allow them to become white noise, but really factor in what these verses are saying. Love is patient. And kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So I have six questions that I want you first to, to think through in your life. I have six questions that I want you first to think through in your life. And then if you really want to know the answer, ask your wife or your husband, ask your kids, ask your coworkers. But these six questions will help us really evaluate, am I, am I driven by love? And the true test is not how we self-evaluate, but how those who are in the closest proximity to us evaluate us as well. The first question is this, am I abrasive? Am I abrasive? Right now, while everybody has to eventually go out of the house at some point and, and get groceries if you don't have access or the ability to to get curbside pickup, then you are just boxed into the store with everybody else shoulder to shoulder with people you really don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with. I have a friend, I won't mention his name, but he was at a, a big warehouse store this week and he was getting a little overcrowded with everybody next to him. So he's perfectly healthy, but he would just start coughing a little bit, clearing his throat, and people would just leave the aisle instantaneously and then he could get the groceries that he wanted. I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just, just letting you know that was... That was his method. My question is, are you abrasive? Think back to a simpler time when you would go to the grocery store. You ever play the checkout game? Oh, I've played the checkout game more times than I care to imagine. As you're making your way to the checkout, you're scanning the lines. You're scanning the lines. And you're like, all right, those four idiots at self-checkout, they've never used a cell phone, so they're not going to figure that out. So self-checkout's out. All right, we've got two people who are unloading their cart in six and seven. One through five isn't open for some reason, not sure why. But six and seven are open, and the self-checkout's open. And then you've got a choice to make, and you're scanning. 
Like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk a little bit faster so I beat everybody else into one of these two aisles. But there's somebody coming up on your right. And so you're going to have to box them in a little bit while you get to choose. And so you are scanning the carts and you're like, oh, no, they look even. I'm going to take seven. And so you swoop in and you steal seven. And then the other person who's next to you gets six. And then they beat you to where their stuff starts getting checked out by 13 seconds. And it ruins your whole day because you chose the slower lane. And you're like, come on, people, it's not hard. The chip cards have been around for three years now. Push it in, pull it out. You don't swipe. It isn't difficult. And for the next two hours, you're still ticked at the grandma in front of you because it took her so long to insert her credit card. The person in aisle six beats you by 13 seconds. It'll ruin your day. I've been guilty of that. I've been guilty of that. The question is, am I abrasive? Am I abrasive? Because love is patient, and love is kind. Love is patient and love is kind. And so if you are an abrasive person, then chances are you have some work to do. Patient and kind. The second question is, am I excited for others? Am I excited for others? When I see somebody have an update on LinkedIn, am I excited for them or do I roll my eyes and think, well, that company made a giant mistake there. When I see somebody celebrating an accomplishment on Facebook? Am I genuinely excited for them? Are you somebody right now who's kind of excited about all the cancellations as a result of corona because it's gotten you out of a lot of graduation parties and weddings you don't want to go to? The question is, am I excited for others? Am I excited for others? Not envious. Love is not envious, and love is not boastful, which means that we have a genuine excitement for other people when their lives experience success and when good things happen to them. It's not, always, it's not always that I have to be the person who's getting along for me, getting ahead for me to be excited. No, 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 no. But I am excited for other people, for what happens to them and where they, where they celebrate, I celebrate with them. That's the question. That's the question. Am I excited for others? The third question. Am I only worried about me? Am I only worried about me? I, I think it's fascinating what, what we've seen for, for a couple weeks on social media that initially reports were coming out of the millennials who were down in Florida for spring break, and then the millennials were like, no, 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 no. We're all out of college now. We're not the people in Florida for spring break. That's Gen Z. And millennials who've been given a really hard time by previous generations, if you saw some of the things that they were posting about people who were out partying at, during spring break, it's like they... They completely don't see it. It's like so many of us. It's like so many of us. When we're the people being criticized, we hate it. And we're like, no, that's not fair. Don't say that about me. How dare you? But when we're the ones offering the critique, all of a sudden that sensitivity is out the window. And so the millennials who were being ganged up on for a really long time by previous generations just let that all air out at Generation Z, who is down partying for spring break. The question, the question is, is, am I only worried about me? Am I only worried about me? Love is not arrogant. Love is not arrogant. Love is not rude. Love is not insisting on its own way. So that's, that's the third question that you have to ask is, am I only worried about me? Question number four is, am I willing to extend grace? Am I willing to extend grace? I heard a pastor say a couple months ago, and, and it just stopped me in my tracks, but I heard a pastor say a couple months ago, I preached grace, but I practiced law. I thought, wow, how true, that, how true can that be in my own life? Then when we stand on a stage, or, or when, when we, again, we need to receive something, we preach grace, and we are so thankful for the work of God and what he's done in our lives, and we preach the message of grace, all the more so when we've messed up and when we need grace, we preach that message, and we love the hope of Jesus. We love the hope that it provides, and so we cling to that message, and we proclaim that message, the message of 
grace. But the question is, when we've been wronged, do we practice law? That doesn't mean that when we've been wronged, we can't hurt. It doesn't mean that when we're wronged, we have to act like nothing happened instantaneously and restore the full relationship automatically. It's a process, but if we're not willing to forgive and move towards reconciliation and start that process, in a lot of regards, we have to ask the question of, am I preaching grace but practicing law? And here's the truth about love. That love is not easily angered. Love is willing to put up with a lot, but also this, that love is is not unwilling to forgive. Resentful is also translation, translated sometimes as keeps no record of wrongs. And so you might have, you might have known this, these verses under that, that it keeps no records of wrongs. And, and the question is, do we preach one thing but practice another in our lives? Or are we people who not only preach grace, but we extend it when we're the people who've been wronged? The, the fifth question is this, am I a critic? Am I a critic? The easiest job in the world is to be a critic. That is the easiest job in the world. The easiest job in the world is to sit back and to point out everything that somebody else does wrong. It's simple. It's incredibly easy to do. Because hindsight is 2020, and you have the benefit of knowing how their decision turned out. You have the benefit of knowing the choices that they made and the results of those choices. So it is the easiest job in the world to be a critic. But if you can't think of a specific way to make something better, then this is just some friendly pastoral advice from Uncle Brian to you. Shut up about it. If you can't think of a way to make something better, then just shut up about it. You don't need to stand and be like, oh, that broken and that was awful and that was terrible. If you can't think of a specific way to do something better, just shut up. It it doesn't matter. Here's the deal. Love doesn't excuse wrong choices. I want to be very clear about that. Love doesn't excuse wrong choices. It doesn't make an excuse for them. But it celebrates repentance. It celebrates the fact that somebody has owned up to the wrong choice that they've made. It celebrates the fact that they recognize that there there was something that was wrong. And they've apologized and they've sought out forgiveness. Love celebrates that fact. It celebrates repentance. And it celebrates forgiveness. Am I a critic? And the last question that I want you to ask is this. Am I hopeful? Am I hopeful? Love refuses to go away. It refuses to lose belief. It never gives up. And it stands the test of time. That, that's what love does. It refuses to go away. It refuses to lose belief. It never gives up, and it stands the test of time. And so these six questions are great for self-evaluation. But they're even better when you ask them to the people who you are in close proximity to who are willing to be honest with you. We continue in verse 8 where we read these words. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Here's the deal. Love lasts forever. Love lasts forever. God is the essence of love. We we understand that from 1 John 4, 8. That God is the essence of love. And so much does love need to be a hallmark of our lives that we are told in that passage that if we're not loving people, we don't follow God because God is the very essence of love. And the reality is this. All of our gifts that God has given us, they won't be needed in heaven. All of our gifts won't be needed in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean that heaven is monotonous. It doesn't mean that heaven is boring. 
It doesn't mean that all heaven is is an eternal worship concert. I know some of you would love nothing more than for that. And others of you are like, look, I've already got to sing five worship songs on Sunday. Like the thought of nothing but singing for all eternity, ah, I'm, I'm not down for that. Don't worry. Heaven is so much more than that. But understand this, the very essence of God is love, and that love is on full display in heaven. And so where we have all of these gifts and all these abilities that God has given us to do great things for His glory, they aren't needed when everybody's already made the decision to follow God. But love? Love is on full display. Love lasts. It stands the test of time. It is eternal. And it is the hallmark of heaven, as it should be the hallmark of our lives. And this theme of love lasting just continues in the next two verses, in verses 9 and 10. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When Jesus comes and he restores everything and all is made right in the world, and when his kingdom is ushered in and his eternal kingdom those who've made the decision to follow Jesus reside for all eternity. Love lasts. The perfection of God's original creation is on full display. And love abounds. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. It's been said, to be loved is to be fully seen and accepted. To be loved is to be fully seen and accepted. It's for all of your flaws, all of your failures, all of your shortcomings, all of the things that you need to work on to be on full display, and for someone to accept you anyway. Not to excuse them, but to accept them. And to not write you off, because there are areas in your life that you need to grow in. And how true of this is what God does for us. That he sees each and every one of us in our imperfection. He sees each and every one of us in all of the areas where we fall short. In all of the things that we've done wrong. And he loved us anyway to the point that he would make a way for us to be restored and redeemed to him, our creator, whom we rebelled against. And sending his son Jesus to die to pay my penalty for the mistakes and the sins I have committed. There is no one who sees your flaws, no one who sees your faults more than God. And he loves you anyway. In spite of that. And then he closes the chapter with these words in verse 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope are perfectly realized, perfectly manifested in heaven. Love is on full display. When I was in high school, I did a couple musicals. And as it was a high school, the budget was rather small. So we would get our, we would get our scripts and we would practice for months on end. And then only a couple days before the show would we have costumes. 
And one day would be spent, we would try on the costumes, we'd have people make alterations to the best of their abilities. The backdrops would be hung, the lighting would be set. And then normally the night before the show opened, we would all arrive, get into full makeup, get into the costumes, and go out and perform a show to an empty auditorium. Now, if you've ever performed a show into an empty auditorium, you understand there's some challenges. There are some factors at play that if there's a joke in the script, you don't know how well the joke's going to land because there isn't an audience. You get a pretty good timing for things, but you're unsure about applause and just some minor other factors. But the point of the dress rehearsal is to run through everything like it's the performance to your best ability. Even though the real thing is a day away. Followers of Jesus, our lives are the dress rehearsal of love. We've got a lot of pieces and a lot of parts. And we live in a world that is in desperate need. But the promise of love is ultimately going to be fulfilled one day in heaven. So let's today, as people who long for that, let's as people who follow Jesus just say, we resolve right now to live our lives like the dress rehearsal and to love every day to the best of our ability to love everyone we can and understand without it we are nothing. God, I pray that we would be people who are the most loving people this world could ever experience. I pray that we would be people who are patient and kind. That we wouldn't be envious or boastful. Wouldn't be proud or self-seeking. Wouldn't be rude. That we wouldn't keep records of wrongs. That we would rejoice in repentance. Repentance. We'd be quick to forgive. And that we would never lose hope. We would never give up. That we would endure. And God, our prayer is that through those things, People would see you through us. That people would see your concern, your care, your grace, your forgiveness. The fact that you never quit. That you have seen us for who we are, our flaws and all, and you love us in spite of it. Let love radiate in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name.